I love the details. I love the historical, you know, the details that, you know, I don't know how much time you've spent on the research. On a lot, a lot. A lot. I mean, we, 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 we have a full-time researcher on the show, which is great. And, and I spend a lot of time, um, just read a ton of shit. <laughs> Excuse my French. <laughs> went, went to a lot of museums, you know, that kind of stuff. You are, and I was talking to Rosario, but um, you obviously take the basis of, of who this character is, Leonardo, and how amazingly um, adventurous and, and what a forerunner he was, and then we're going, particularly the season seems way off into it. Speculation. Why did you decide to do that? Well, there are there are four missing years in his life. That's uh, they, between about 22nd and 32. No one knows where he was or what he was doing. There's a huge section of his notebooks that are missing. Yeah. So whereas a lot of the stuff that occurs in Italy and the stuff that occurred in the first season had historical linchpins mm -hmm. to um, to hold people's hands as we walk through, uh, in the second season there are where Riario and Da Vinci and, and other characters go in South America. There is no. There's nothing. Really that was always the pitch. Is that we were there was this beautiful chunk of missing years and and even within this time period famously I mean we have two letters that Leonardo wrote claiming that he was in Syria working for the Ottoman Empire I, I we're not making this up he there are two letters that exist saying that's what he was doing and some people say historians say that he was it was a joke and other people claim that's what he was really doing um, so, but also I've been reading a lot recently, there are a number of books have come out uh, positing that uh, China had sent two missions to the Americas, I think in the 10th century, in the 12th century, and that they had explorers there, and that there were a number of Europeans that were there well before Pizarro and others, and so I, I just, I had always joked that this show was the secret history of the man who invented the future, but by extension kind of the secret history of the world, so I had always intended this show to travel all over the world, and um, you know these are his hidden adventures. And so you have to go four years missing. He could be anywhere. He could be anywhere. So you're really expanding the, the world in this series because you're going out of England. So oh yeah, 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 yeah. I mean, so. we're 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 not just in Florence. We're in Rome. We're in Genoa. We're in Naples, um, and then we're in South America, and technically, I guess. We're in Peru and Panama, I mm -hmm. guess, for some of the show, and then we're in another country that we're not allowed to talk about yet, that we'll be showing later on in the season. Yeah. Season three, another planet. Yes. <laughs> there is, there's no limit to the scope of the show. We could go down under in season three. Down under, go to Australia. Down under, well, New Zealand. the <laughs> nice thing is, having, having pulled off, Stars had some apprehension about how we were going to pull off uh, the Inca Empire, um, but some apprehension. Some, some yeah, yes. <laughs> but but they were really happy. I mean, we're almost done filming the second season. They, they were really happy with what we pulled off. And I can genuinely say that the the effects and the sets and the, the visuals are even more spectacular this season than last season. And having pulled off pulled that off, they said, okay, we'll, we'll give you license. You can take the show anywhere in the world you want now. That's cool. We feel like you can pull it off. As long as you're staying around. No, I mean, not, we, we, we didn't completely shoot in Wales. We, we, we shot plate photography um, in in Mexico, and we were in Cornwall, which is outside of Wales, and, and, and knock on wood, but we're talking about a third season, and, and I actually hope to physically bring the main cast and crew to um, another country for two or three weeks to do some filming. But I don't want to say what that country is because it'll give away some of where we're going to be this season. <laughs> Mr. Goyer. Hi. Yes. Um, what's your writing process like? Uh, more specifically, how do you go from the initial idea to fleshing it out to a TV show or a movie? Um, I always start with the research period, which is just, I just blue sky and read any and everything that I can. And right. even if that's Batman or Superman, I, I, I read stuff, anything I think might, uh, I, I'm fortunate that I also have, I mean we have a, a, a researcher that works full time on Da Vinci, but I also have a researcher that I employ that works full time for me, okay. which is awesome, and I'll just say, get me stuff on whatever, nanotechnology, and this <laughs> and that, and um, that's a, he's got a fun job, and wow. uh, so I, I start with that for a month or two, and then... Then I start outlining, and um, 
and then uh, I write an outline and uh, it's for myself that I don't show to the studios and then do a first draft and you know, just go from there. Right. <laughs> I studied Da Vinci in college, I guess, but I don't didn't know most of the things that you learned from the show. What's the most surprising thing about him that you've learned from him? Um, it was probably his anatomy of dissection of corpses, and, and, and I, when I saw a, an exhibition of his that showed how deep into anatomy he went, at the very end there was a piece saying that if it was lost in history or, or in an archive that worked, but if it had come out, he would be the greatest anatomist that had ever lived. Think, how is that? How is that just a side, something that no one a hobby? How do you have that as a hobby? And you would have been the greatest that anyone had ever known. Um, so moments like that, but also I was, and it's the strange. The, the double-edged sword of the part is that people have such expectations of who he was and yet you want to do justice to the stuff that you found out about him in his 20s that no one really knows. But there, there's just a lot, of, a lot of misinformation about yeah, that. There is. Um, I mean, a lot of and people say they he's know him. He's held in such high regard that it's very, if people assume they have an idea in their head of who he is and you want to do, particularly in our sort of slightly crazy version of it, the version that is as has the foundations in reality as best as possible. That reality isn't necessarily what's in people's heads. And we found out, we were in Florence when we premiered the show mm. last year, and uh, we found out some things that, I mean, this is too, this is true, but it's too great. Like if we did it, people would say it's bullshit, mm. which is that, that at one point, Leonardo and Botticelli had a restaurant on the Ponte Vecchio together. And it, it's a sitcom version. Yeah, and, it, and, and this is true, and it ran for about a year, but it failed because they were much more concerned about like the presentation of the food than they were about getting the food out on time and stuff. And, <laughs> and uh, that was, the, these historians are telling us, that was when you realized that no matter what you do, you can't, you know, we're not going, the show is what the show is, we're not going to please everyone. We, I watched two historians argue so hard. Someone said, Leonardo was a very thin man. He was a very, very oh, thin yeah, man yeah. who only ate vegetables. And the other one, what are you talking about? He was fat. He loved cake. <laughs> and they just, these two Italians arguing. And these are historic Italian historians getting in a fight over it. And, over cake and we're just or saying, vegetables. You know what? We can't. <laughs> there's no winning. Yeah. You know, everyone has their conceptions of him, so we're just going to do our version. Do our version. Which is nice, because then you can take your own liberties. And yeah. like, well, this is my version. Yeah. And this season, certainly people know what they're going to get. So it's Yeah. I, I mean, I think first season people are like, well, um, you know, his hair is longer, or this or that, and then, um, but I, I mean, I just love the fact that um, Vasari, who was a fairly contemporary biographer, said that he bent, you know, steel bars with his hands and wrestled with bears. Like, I don't think that really happened, but, but that was a... But regardless, I'm wrestling a bear. Yeah. <laughs> Who's yeah. worse at nitpicking, uh, Da Vinci scholars or comic book fans? Ooh, oh, comic book fans. <laughs> I mean, I, I mean, I find I find Da Vinci scholars to be more forgiving than comic book oh. fans. <laughs> but I get angry at the comic book fans because I I, I know this stuff just as well as they do. So I'm like, you know what? Shut up. Are <laughs> <laughs> you outraged about the Ben Affleck No. I, he's going to be amazing. Yeah. I, trust me. <laughs> Yeah, he had some writers to say something with Matt Fraction and Jonathan Hickman. They yes, yes. Well, that was that's one of the one of the you know uh, I I mean I continue to be a comic book fan and I was a fan of, of Hickman and Fraction's work and I did not know them and one of the one of the perks of this job is occasionally you can call up people like that and, and say to stars I want to bring these comic book guys in and they're like really have they ever written a script before Nope. <laughs> uh, but I want to give them a try and so I, I cold called both of them and said okay I've got this crazy proposition do you want to come in and join the writers room you know for two or three weeks and do an episode each with us and you know you'll get an entry into script writing and um, and I've since become friends with both of them and and, and they really grabbed the opportunity mm. with both hands I mean the episodes are really fantastic yeah I said yesterday that the, the Matt Fraction episode is the most Da Vinci's Demons y episode of Da Vinci's Demons that you can imagine. That was, I mean, I, I cherry picked it because that, that, I wrote that one with Matt yeah. and I, I, you were right I was like, okay, I'm doing that. I've already written the pilot for Da Vinci's Demons before that thing by Hickman had come out. And then when he came to LA to visit for the show and we showed him a pilot. He, yeah, we were both writing these sort of crazy alternate histories with Leonardo da Vinci, so um, who knows, maybe third season we'll bring in someone else. <laughs> and then, where are the, I love how 
allow you to pick the invention, how how Leonardo comes up with the inventions. Are those all actually accurate? Everything you're saying and showing, not pretty how much. He came up with it. Pretty much. I mean, he didn't necessarily build them, but there's certainly these. Yeah, some of them he designed. But I mean, some of them he designed and built. Some of them he just designed, and we don't know whether or not he actually built them. But part of the promise of the show, the sort of candy of the show, is that he is going to build and employ a lot of those things. And it's a push-pull because they're, some of them we actually build, and they're very expensive for augmented visual effects, and so we can kind of afford to do one every two episodes. So we've got ten episodes this season, so I think we've got about five. Yeah. He was a busy boy. I talked a lot of sex, too. He, he did. He did. <laughs> <laughs> Polyamorous sex. That's more time than I do. Yeah. Um, I, 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 yeah. Um, yes, polyamorous sex. <laughs> Is sexuality something that you had researched? It's true. I mean, I didn't know that about him. Well, I mean, people... There's certainly... There's one Trump camp that say he was homosexual. Dead. There's another camp that maintain he was heterosexual. There's another camp that maintains he was bisexual. Asexual. I, uh, well. Asexual. <laughs> I, I'm sort of in the camp that he was bisexual, that, and that, that that, particularly in artists and people in, in and amongst forms at the time in the Renaissance, that that was, that was, that didn't, that was relatively common, and it didn't have the, people were not as uptight about sexuality back then, oddly enough, as they are now. It wasn't. It wasn't like a big deal. But I think the the route that we took that was very was was the most interesting. Is that if if he, in his notebooks he had written down like this is my sexuality, this is who I'm in love with at any point, it would have been sacrilegious to, to deviate from that. But but he refused. He never wrote anything. He never down, commented on his sexuality ever throughout his life. So the fact that there is nothing there and he chose to not define himself by that was very interesting. Why why did he choose that? Maybe that's the route we should take. We certainly didn't avoid. Uh, sexuality question to do for any to please an audience one way or the other is it's just what would make yeah, a man not with it head on in the, in the fifth episode yeah. people seem more accepting of violence than they are like, well that's, that's, that's a, you know people in America are more accepting of violence and people in Europe are more accepting of sexuality I mean it's just it's the puritanical thing 